I was an entrepreneur all my life, <clears throat> driven by sort of the entrepreneurial spirit, and I was a software entrepreneur for many years. And when I sold that company in 2005, having been an over-educated observer of climate change for many years, I decided to toss my hat in the ring on the clean tech side, viewing technology there as a solution to a problem rather than as a sort of a toy or a game or simply a means to make money. Clean tech is, you know, the means by which humans will have a sustainable relationship with the planet. I think one of the things that's happened, particularly since I grew up as a, as a, as a kid and a you know, young man even, that software and computers, these were the technologies that one automatically thought about when you thought about high tech. And there's also this biomedical in the background too, and nanotechnology and all this kind of really cool stuff. A lot of it's for entertainment, but a lot of it is, is, is certainly a, a part of our economic infrastructure. But that's what we think about when we think about technology. But just like a fish doesn't know they swim in water, <laughs> What the technology that dominates our lives today, but which is invisible to us to a large extent, is the fossil fuel infrastructure and the electrical infrastructure. This is the largest and most complex machine humankind has ever built. It is by far more complicated, more capital intensive, and more difficult to operate than the internet. Um, and it runs everything. We have this feeling that we have some kind of control over the world, that we as humans are so smart that we've out outsmarted Mother Nature, when in fact we have no control. And so I'm wondering what you think it is about these toys, what you think it is about this technology that lulls us into the sense that we are the user. I think our current view about the relationship of technology, mankind, and the world started with Sir Francis Bacon, right, who really said, you know, opposable thumbs and some rationality allows us to be masters of our domain. And that's really dominated how it is that we see ourselves in the world. There are always dissonant voices, but roughly we're the ones that are in control and we're the ones that shape it. The Green Revolution in agriculture allowed us to decide how much food we wanted and turn the knob up and down. But I think um, what's happened is we're finding out that's not true. I, mean, I don't know that we have no control, uh, but we certainly don't have the kind of control that we think we have. So in a virtual reality, I think in my mind what really defines it is that you've got the ability as a designer to decide what are the, what are the macroscopic variables that will, that will control this world. You're playing God in a sense, right? You're defining almost what time is. You're defining all the kinds of global variables and all the ways in which things interact. And if things go wrong, I mean, in a worst case scenario, you just press the reset button in the front of the computer and you start again. Uh, we can't do that with the planet, <laughs> so uh, there is no reset button. Uh, and so we're beginning to find that the sense of control that we had that came from Sir Francis Bacon and was really deeply embedded in our relationship to our cars, our computers, our telephones, we demanded of those things complete control. And if they were not completely controlled, there was a malfunction at the factory and you sent it back and you got a new one, right? Um, so that's the way in which we've been dealing with technology, interacting with technology, both as designers of technology, in terms of what you think you're able to do in controlling what that thing does, and as users. And I think that I think it's generated a real mythology uh, in, in our culture, but I think it's also wired our brains in a different way. I mean, our, we're neural networks. We're essentially pattern recognizing machines. And the way in which you've experienced the world in the past forms and dictates the way that we react to the world in the future. And I think deeply embedded in our neural networks and who we are is a view of ourselves in the world in which technology allows us to have a controlling and commanding hand. And I think that myth is getting busted right now. How do we develop more of a symbiotic relationship, not only with our technology, but with the world? It seems like those two things have to go hand in hand. Well, I think the first thing we do is we, we, we need to think hard about where we're living and how we're living. So you can define virtual worlds in a number of ways, right? So when you play with Lego as a kid, that's a virtual world, right? You're deciding what that structure is. You're deciding what happens there. In the same way, we have World of Warcraft or Facebook, or these are virtual worlds as well. And in the same way, I think when you sit in an apartment in a downtown Toronto and you're watching you know, the fires in Texas or the floods in Pakistan on your TV, and you're ordering, you know, take in or you know, take out food. That's a kind of virtual world too. There's an entire ecosystem out there that is beginning to shake. Yeah. And we can keep that at bay for a certain amount of time, but eventually you're gonna to try to order takeout food and it's gonna be really expensive or not there. And so that virtual world will begin to collapse inward. And so I think the first thing we need to do is have an adult discussion about who we are, about what it is that, that feeds us, how we get fed. I mean, this is sort of, old stuff, right? I mean, we have to be aware of where our food comes from. We might want to be aware of what the atmosphere can do, you know? And I think we've been lulled into a sense of security over a long time. We're very wealthy. You know, most people can sit in that air-conditioned apartment or take out food. And, and that's, that sort of, again, has lulled us into a sense of, of, a, of a false kind of reality. It's a bubble that will burst. 
the one thing I think that even gamers have that we're not applying to this world is an end result, the end game, what you're playing towards, where you're going. And I think it's something that we haven't necessarily thought, fought through. We're, we're playing through all these levels. We're trying to rack up as much gold as we can, <laughs> as much points as we can, all this gear. But we're not really, even inside of this game, we know we can start over or think we can start over. But we don't, we haven't, I think, fully thought, thought through what the quest objective is. That's a really good question. Um, I mean, that's asking why we're doing what we're doing. Economic activity for the sake of economic activity, growth for the sake of growth. I mean, yeah. we, we were trapped inside this sort of self-perpetuating machine. On the economic side, we don't know how to get out of it. We don't know how to operate in an economy without real growth. We really don't. Um, so the whole thing becomes unstable when growth begins to flatten out. And we know we can't grow forever. This is a finite world. It's not a virtual world. I think the next phase of our kind of intelligence is to be able to work and understand interactively with natural forces, to go back to and, and, and pick up some of the principles that we must have had embedded deeply within our collective psyches hundreds of years ago when we did move in natural rhythms. Only now we're gonna do it with technology at our side, with technology that works with those flows, that captures those flows and allows those, allows those flows to then shape the energy that shapes the gadgets that move, moves our lives. So that's the technological way in which I think our intelligence can get expressed. <laughs>